Thank you for joining us today. We'll just wait a couple of seconds for everyone to get connected and then we can start. Okay, it seems like people are popping in. So good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today uh, and welcome to the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice webinar. Um, my name is Brooke Tasama and I'm one of the facilitators of the online adaptation community of practice, which is run by us here at the, the Climate Risk Institute. And I'm here today with my colleague, Claire Sanders, who will be in the back end and providing support. So if at any time during the webinar, you have any questions or experience technical difficulties, you can click on the chat box and find Claire's name or my name and send us a message and we'll sort it out. So like I said, again, thank you for joining us. And before we go any further, I would like to gratefully acknowledge that I'm currently located in the traditional unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Mississaugas of the Credit Union. Um, Indigenous people have long modeled sustainable forest management and land stewardship. And at the Climate Risk Institute, we're continually trying to improve both our knowledge processes and relationships so that we can highlight and integrate indigenous perspectives and knowledge of climate change into our work. And I invite you all to share the territories uh, that you're joining us from today in the chat, if you're able. I would also like to take this opportunity to reintroduce the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice or FACOP as it's more commonly known. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, the FACOP is an online community of practitioners dedicated to sharing online resources, news articles, discussion forums, upcoming climate change events, and more. And this is made possible with support from the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers Climate Change Task Force, and it's free to join. So if there's anyone today who's interested in learning more about the FACOP, uh, you can click on the link we'll post in the chat. And if you want to register, you can contact me as well, and we can we can proceed with that. And so we'll have some time at the end for a dedicated Q&A, but that doesn't mean you have to hold your questions until then. So feel free to add questions in the Q&A box or comment in the chat below and we'll direct them to our speaker when he wraps up. And I also wanna mention that we are recording the webinar today and we'll be sending out a copy of the recording to all those who registered, so, so yeah. And with that being said, we are very excited to have our speaker for today, Darren Sleep. Uh, uh, Darren Sleep is the Senior Director of Conservation Strategies with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, or SFI, where he focuses on growing SFI's conservation and science credentials and on increasing SFI's capacity to develop and manage conservation projects in Canada and the United States. Uh, Darren sits on a number of government and ENGO advisory board bodies, including the Committee on the Status of Species at Risk in Ontario and the United States Economic Commission for Europe, for Europe Boreal Team of Specialists. He was also part of the primary task force team and is currently involved with the Sustainable Use and Livelihood Specialist Group with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, prior to joining SFI, Darren worked as a project leader in the forest ecology at the National Council for Air and Sea Improvement, where he worked on issues of relevance to the forest sector and liaised with the scientific and conservation biology communities. He holds a PhD in zoology from the University of Guelph. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Darren, for taking the time to present this webinar for us today is very much appreciated. So without further ado, I'll now things, turn things over to you to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks very much for the uh, introduction. Um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be here to talk about the work that SFI has been doing in the climate adaptation space. Um, I should say that I'm coming to you today from uh, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people or the Anishinaabe here in uh, what is now Ottawa. Um, uh, but we also have offices in, uh, in DC, Washington DC, uh, which is the traditional territory of the Natkoch Tank and Piscataway peoples. Um, with that, I'm, I'm really happy to be, to be talking to you about this work. Um, you'll, you'll see that, that we've been developing our climate adaptation work over the last uh, couple of years, and we're really excited to talk to you about, uh, about what we've done with our standard revision. So for those of you who may not be, first of all, I, I should say I just changed the screen just 
double checking. Uh, Brooke, uh, are we seeing the new screen? Did I change screens? Yes, yes it worked. We Excellent, <laughs> good to know, thanks. So for those of you who may not be familiar with SFI, SFI is a conservation organization and we have at our core, this uh, vision of a world that values and, and benefits from sustainably managed forests. And we do all of that through uh, forest focused collaborations. We advance this work uh, working with a number of organizations, be they government agencies, uh, consultants, uh, academics, or, or environmental organizations uh, to develop projects that contribute towards this world that, that uh, values uh, sustainably managed forests. Uh, SFI is uh, at its core, we are a, a forest certification standard. Uh, we account for roughly 25% of all global certified forests. We have the largest uh, certified uh, certification uh, organization in the world in that sense. We have the, the most territory. Um, and uh, we are endorsed internationally by the Program for the, for the Endorsement of Sustainable Forest Management Certifications, PEFC. Um, and our logo, though, you know, all of our forests that we have certified are in North America, our logo is recognized uh, around the world. So uh, it's, it's a global organization in that sense. Uh, at SFI, we break our work up into what we call our four pillars of work. Um, so obviously, you know, we are a forest standard. So we do have our, our standards team that develops the standards and works, you know, works to promote the standards and, and, and deal with all of our certified organizations. But we also have these other three streams of work in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see education. This is our work where we, uh, for those of you who may be familiar with Project Learning Tree in the US or Project Learning Tree Canada, where we develop a curriculum from kids K to 12, uh, particularly in the US. And in Canada, we really work on uh, mentoring youth uh, at the uh, post-secondary level, uh, mentoring them, getting them into jobs. We have a green jobs program that we work on with the federal government and, and other means like, uh, like that. In the bottom right, we have our community work where we, we engage with a number of underprivileged communities to make sure that it's not just sort of, you know, the, the wealthy people that get to benefit from the forest, but everyone across society benefits from the forest. So we work with a number of uh, charitable organizations in the US and Canada, most notably uh, Habitat for Humanity, for example, is a, a strong partner of ours, uh, where we essentially marry an organization like Habitat for Humanity that needs two by fours with organizations that make two by fours. So it's, it's a good, uh, a good uh, connection. And finally, in the, in the top uh, right, you'll see the conservation pillar, and that's obviously where I work. But it's worth noting that anyone who works within these uh, different work streams contributes to each other. So I get calls all the time from our education folks to review the materials we're using or our standards folks to make sure that the best available conservation science feeds into our standards. Uh, SFI is in terms of, of growth over the years, this is a, this is a figure that represents our area certified uh, since 2000 to 2020 uh, at the North American scale. So you can see uh, 150 million hectares in North America, we have a significant footprint. What this means is that any changes we make to the standard uh, affects a huge footprint. So uh, one little change to a standard can actually affect a lot of different uh, uh, areas across North America and, and have a, a large impact. Uh, if you look, if you zoom this down a little bit to just Canada, 122 million. So, so the majority of those hectares in general are in Canada, uh, where we have certified forests uh, from coast to coast in Canada, with the exception of PEI that doesn't actually have any uh, large scale managed forests, but every other province uh, uh, we are represented in. So uh, we've got a, a large footprint across the country. We're here to talk about climate change adaptation, and we know at our core that uh, forests are an incredibly powerful tool in helping us deal with climate change. We know that sustainably managed forests uh, capture carbon faster than unmanaged forests, for example. And we know that younger trees, and I don't mean little tiny saplings, but you know, mid mid uh, age trees, uh, if they're well tended and well cared for, they will really capture carbon very fast. Uh, and, and it's a very powerful tool as we deal with climate. Uh, and we recognize that, that we have a, a large responsibility to help make sure that our forests uh, do everything they can to, to sequester carbon and help us deal with climate change. Uh, in fact, we've done some assessments in our footprint and we found that uh, the carbon stored within the SFI footprint, that's at a North American scale, uh, would, is, is more carbon than would be emitted uh, by uh, 30 billion cars in a year, which is uh, actually way more than the number of cars that are currently in existence on the planet. So we know that, that we have this 
capacity to store a massive amount of carbon and to, and to sequester it. But the question is, you know, how do we know this? How have we done these assessments? So we've worked a little bit with a number of organizations. As I said, we're very collaborative. I work with the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement. We developed a, a carbon assessment of the SFI U, uh, US footprint, uh, keeping in mind that uh, the way we assess carbon in Canada versus the US is different based on different uh, data that is available to, to do the work with. Uh, this was done using a lot of FIA data, uh, and we developed a carbon tool that if you want to play around with it, you can. Uh, this is the kind of information that it will generate. There's the, the URL for it, uh, forest.org carbon dash tool. Uh, that that uh, tool is available for anyone to, to use and, and look at, and it looks at uh, carbon at the county scale across uh, the US where we have SFI certified land. So this, these numbers you're seeing here is at the, the full US extent of certified uh, land. And you can see that there's a, a whole lot of forest carbon that's stored there. And we also include an analysis, analysis in there of carbon in the, uh, the, both the pulpwood and the saw timber value chain. So you can see over time it does diminish as it, uh, as it gets released to the atmosphere, but a lot of it, particularly the stored saw timber, uh, stays in the system for a, a very long time. So uh, we've, we've done a lot of analysis to try and to get at that. When we think about the same kind of uh, information in the Canadian context, uh, you know, we had to do the Canadian Forest Carbon Assessment with a team of folks from the uh, Saskatchewan Research Council, Natural Resources Canada, CFS, uh, with some support from the Forest Products Association of Canada. Uh, we did this work uh, to try and reliably estimate the carbon stocks and fluxes across SFI's footprint. Uh, but it's worth noting that, that because SFI's footprint is so very large, it's costly and, and challenging to do. So again, we worked with our colleagues at CFS who use the uh, uh, gen generic carbon budget model to do this work. And we did a sample of just under 20% of SFI's footprints. So you can see that map there. Those are the areas that we, that we assessed. So a little bit West Coast, a little bit East Coast, and then sort of a swath in between of, of Boreal Plains area. Um, and this work showed us that in terms of sequestration, that this area alone, so just the sampled area, sequesters roughly 4.5 million tons of CO2 equivalents uh, annually, and that's an above ground pool, so that doesn't uh, consider soils. Um, and, you know, I've got two asterisks here. I could put 50 asterisks here to, to you know, emphasize that we have not done the analysis across the entire footprint. But if we assume that, you know, that's 18.3% of SFI's certified forests in Canada, and we extrapolate that, it could be in the rough area of 24.4 million tons of CO2 uh, E uh, sequestered across Canada. So that's just a, a very ballpark figure. But the, the lesson here is that the sustainably managed forest within the SFI uh, footprint, you can see, is accumulating and continues to accumulate carbon over time. So that's a, that's a very positive story. So we know that we store a lot of carbon and we sequester a lot of carbon uh, in our footprint. Uh, what does that mean for our standard going forward? So if we look back to this paper that was published in 2020 on climate smart forestry, the missing link, this was a uh, uh, paper published in part by uh, a number of colleagues uh, internationally looking at what is needed um, and, and you know, what, what we need to do to, to get to the point that forestry is actually serving that role of helping us mitigate carbon as much as possible. So uh, from this uh, paper, uh, they came up with these three key elements of uh, climate smart forestry. One is increase uh, carbon stored in forest and wood products while maintaining other ecosystem services, be that biodiversity, water, you know, uh, clean air, all those great things. Uh, it, another element was to enhance forest health and resilience through adaptive forest management. So that's keeping in mind uh, that with climate change comes greater risk to our forests, either in terms of pest outbreaks or fires. So we've got to make sure that forest health and resilience is maintained uh, when the work we do. And finally, the third point is um, that we need to use wood resources sustainably to substitute for non-renewable or more carbon intensive materials. So those are the three key elements of, of what these authors felt climate smart forestry was. Uh, and it, it's really good. I can honestly say that um, uh, in, if I'm being honest, we saw this paper uh, after we initiated our, our climate smart forestry work. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we, we echo this uh, firmly. So we revise our standards at SFI every five years or so. Um, 
we started back in, uh, we actually started in, in October of 2019 uh, down this road, but you can see here, we, you know, we drafted the standards, including the Climate Smart Forestry Objective, received comments May, June, 2020. Uh, we had various task groups that looked at our different components, including the Climate Smart Forestry. Uh, once we had the final version of it ready, it went to our resources committee who reviewed it and then went to the board and the board approved it. And then, as I said before, we are endorsed by PEFC on the international stage. We had to get endorsement from them. So we sent our standards, our revised standards off to them uh, for, um, uh, for endorsement. And then in January of this year, we released those standards for use by our certified organizations. So those now are in play. If we look at, you know, as I said, we are very collaborative. We did not do this by ourselves. This was not, you know, me locked in an office, you know, writing new standards. But in fact, this is getting a lot of uh, participation from a number of different uh, sectors of society, be it government, indigenous. We had manufacturers. Uh, you can see the whole list here. We had a wide variety of folks involved with these task groups, uh, not just for the forest management task group, but for for all the parts of the standards that we revised. So we make sure that we're collaborating with people across civil society to do this work. It's again, it's not just SFI sitting by ourselves doing this. Uh, so the standards were officially launched January of this year. Uh, all these documents are available online. Um, I, can, I can send you the, uh, the link for, uh, simply the, the website is www.forest.org is, is our website. If someone wants to pop that in the chat, that'd be awesome. Um, but you can go there, you can find everything we're doing and there's sections on our new standard that you can pull up, you can read all these documents and see for yourself what's involved. I'm really focusing here on the standards and rules SFI 2022, the forest management standard in particular. And the revisions that we did to this standard here are all the, you know, what we call the major objectives uh, for the standard. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to focus on objective uh, nine and 10. So the climate smart forestry and the fire resilience and awareness objectives. Uh, that's where I'm really focusing uh, the talk today. So to start, if we look at the climate smart forestry objective, um, again, we recognize that forests play a critical role in addressing climate change and storing carbon. Uh, we see very much an increased global focus on climate and, and not just, uh, you know, locally, but we see this on the international stage for markets. Everyone wants to know about this. We also know that um, ESG reporting, which is becoming more and more dominant in financial markets, one of the things that they're looking very closely at is, is uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, we knew from some work we'd done before that elements of the standard already aided in, in addressing climate uh, through resiliency, reforestation, forest self. When you cut down a forest, you're obligated to promptly reforest it. So we knew there were already some positive things involved, uh, but we really felt, and I, I remember this as clear as day, we had a, one of our members sit down with us and say, we don't need to just beef up the standards for climate change. We need a whole new objective focused on climate change. Uh, so that uh, set off a process of us, you know, uh, really looking hard at how we could do this. Uh, in the end, we developed this uh, Climate Smart Forestry Objective that really has two components within it. The first component is asking our certified organizations to identify and address climate change risks. So they have to do the analysis to look at what things are likely to happen on their certified areas, and more importantly, which of those things are likely to cause big effects. Uh, if they're, you know, something that is going to happen, but it's relatively minor, that's not a big concern. Uh, if something is major, but the odds of it happening are very slim, you know, we don't care. What we're really interested in is focus on the things that will happen and the things that will have the largest effect. So there's an analysis required there, and we, we require these certified organizations to report back to us on, on you know, what they've discovered and what they, uh, how they will address it. The second part is to look at ways to address opportunities to mitigate climate. So that may involve um, changing your silvicultural practices to increase carbon sequestration on the land base, or it might be to look at your operations and see if there's a way you can reduce emissions from your operations. Uh, ideally, it's both. Uh, but you know, we're really asking certified organizations to figure out the ways to, to do better at what they're doing to help mitigate climate. Again, there's this really uh, key 
part here to think about prioritizing risks and vulnerabilities. And it's right out there in that, in that zone of higher priority that we want our certified organizations to, to look at. We want to think about the impacts, positive, negative, actual, potential, direct, indirect, indirect short-term or long-term, uh, and really think about where, where's the best bang for your buck? Where can you do something from an adaptive management point of view to get better at uh, dealing with climate change as it comes our way. The idea is, as you know, we look back at that paper, we really wanna have forests that are healthy and resilient in the face of climate change. So we've really asked our certified organizations to dig into that uh, particular element of their work. That second objective that I wanna talk about is the fire resilience and awareness. Um, again, you know, it's no surprise to anyone in this group that the link between wildfires and climate is well documented, well understood. We know that we are experiencing greater, longer fire seasons, and more intense fires, larger fires, and we really need to do something to address it because that is truly uh, instant oxidization of carbon straight into the atmosphere. And we need to do something as a as a, a country, as an as a sector, to try and reverse that or, or try and control it. So we came up with this fire resilience and awareness objective and how we could get our certified organizations to better manage those concerns. Similar to the, to the Climate Smart Forestry Objective, it's got two elements. Uh, the first is you know, on the lands that they own and manage, we're asking them to really dig in, look at the literature, look at the science, look at their indigenous knowledge base and say, what can we do to limit the susceptibility of our landscape to these undesirable impacts of wildfire? Are there ways that we can uh, reduce the likelihood of them happening? Is there ways we can, uh, we can make it so that the, the forest will rebound better from those fires? Um, we're looking at stand and landscape level management techniques to promote forest health and resilience, whether it's prescribed fire or cultural burning or thinning or hazardous fuel reduction. Um, and then to promote restoration and future forest resilience of those forests that, that you know, when there are fires, how fast can you get in and improve the, the stand uh, and get it back uh, into, into a healthier state so the whole forest is more resilient to fires. The second side of that, uh, of that objective is to do community engagement, to work either individually or through cooperative efforts with other companies or uh, with what we call our standard implementation committee, which are regional subgroups uh, that help implement the standard. Uh, work with communities, raise awareness of, of forest fires and fire management, uh, get communities to understand the role they have to play in reducing fire risk, uh, and getting them to understand the, the actions that are being taken by certified organizations to, re to reduce fire risk. So, I mean, you know, we want to really uh, not only create forests that are more resilient to fire and recover faster, but we want communities that are more resilient to fire and recover faster. So, uh, this is all about, you know, minimizing or reducing the undesirable impacts of carbon emissions, water quality effects, air quality, species quantity, habitat, public safety, human health, the works. So that's, that's the work of the Climate Smart Forestry. When we speak about forest resilience, you might wonder about, you know, well, how do we know that practices we're, we're advocating for that we're suggesting, how do we know these practices will contribute to forest resilience? There's two elements to SFI's work that are worth noting here. One is that the standard requires certified organizations to be actively involved in research. So if you're a, a certified organization on the landscape, you're SFI certified, you either are involved, actively involved with uh, forest research, or you're not SFI certified. That's what it comes down to. Uh, it's, a, it's a requirement of the standard. Um, on top of that, SFI has its own research program that we, we do through collaborative work with, with organizations where we, we provide uh, small to medium grants to a number of organizations to do work. Uh, and a lot of that work has been focused around forest resilience to, to climate. So this is just one example that I'm gonna offer here. Uh, we worked with uh, Manomet in, in Maine to do this work in New England. Um, and it was to provide certified organizations in that area with a suite of tools that they could use to establish baseline conditions so they could understand what their forest was doing today uh, and then think about what is going to happen in the longer term uh, and develop these tools to assess resilient to climate change, monitor its effects, 
uh, and develop practices that they could put on the ground to uh, both reduce the effects of climate change if possible and make those forests again, more resilient in the face of climate change. So we had a number of project partners beyond Manomat, including a number of, of companies in that area. And a lot of the, the tools that they came up with, they came up with these entire uh, checklists that can be used by certified organization. And it, although it is uh, developed in New England, it is certainly applicable to you know, Southern Quebec and, and the Maritimes, but the process they use and a lot of the questions they ask would be transferable to other parts of the SFI footprint. So this is the kind of work we do through our grants program, through our research program, to try and develop the tools and the practices to, to better address these, uh, these issues. I'm just taking a quick look at uh, my clock to see where I'm at. Um, as I mentioned earlier, SFI has a huge footprint. Um, uh, and you know, when we, we think about the, the supply chain of SFI certified forests and the products, uh, we believe this generates that, uh, you know, as again, that paper re referred to sustainably managed products uh, that support nature-based solutions uh, and then can contribute to uh, carbon management, uh, climate change mitigation efforts, and to offset uh, the products that might uh, be harder on the environment. Uh, we've done some work again with uh, another collaborator, University of Maine, uh, looking at soil carbon. And soil carbon is something that I think that, that we really need to dig into and understand a little bit better. Uh, but we really got these folks to dig in and say, look, what are the practices that we can put in place and what practices are currently in, in place that do better for soil productivity and carbon storage within those soils? So these folks went out, uh, they had a, a suite of, of uh, installations, you know, harvested areas put in across uh, sort of a transect north to south in, in Maine. Uh, and they measured soil carbon at various layers. Uh, and they were able to come back to us and say, okay, here are the types of harvesting in this environment that are beneficial to soils um, in terms of carbon storage. Uh, and, and here are some practices you can put in place to improve your management of these. Uh, some of them were, were um, surprising because it, some of the practices that they talked about were things that other organizations had already done, had already had in place. Uh, so for example, laying slash down on skitter trails uh, was originally to help reduce soil compaction, especially when soils start getting a little wet in the spring. Uh, but they actually found that that practice did a good job of helping maintain the soils, uh, the carbon in the soils rather, in the upper and lower layers of the soil. So we we're really happy with this work. Uh, the Cooperative Forest Research Unit was able to communicate this across Maine, New Hampshire, uh, and other parts of New England. Uh, and of course, we've been promoting it within the SFI uh, Forest Management Standard. So this is the kind of work that we're, we're quite happy about. Uh, we also did a more broad spectrum uh, project with American Forests, uh, and they looked at how soils and soil carbon is included in carbon calculations. Uh, again, this is one of the things that is, it's not fully, I wouldn't say it's ignored, but uh, it's very hard to get good numbers on soil. Uh, and we felt this project was really useful for increasing our understanding of whole ecosystem carbon dynamics, as well as the impacts of forest management on the entire forest carbon pool. Uh, the results of this work, uh, not really surprisingly, pointed that forest management was not an issue for forest soils so much as the history of that forest. So if in the past it was uh, used for intensive agriculture, the soils tend to be more depleted of carbon. Um, so, you know, this work was, was really informative uh, looking at a sort of all of the Northeast US uh, and a little bit into Canada, looking at what practices and what, uh, what activities were good and or bad uh, for forest soil carbon. Of course, all these objectives, not just nine and 10, but the rest of, of the objectives we've developed really come down to how practices are used, you know, what practices are used and how are they applied. Uh, so we've been doing some work with uh, our SICs. Again, these are the standard implementation committees to develop playbooks to help uh, forest operators, uh, certified organizations across SFI, develop practices, develop adaptation plans to help them uh, meet the objectives of nine and 10, uh, but also to, to make sure that the work they're doing on those landscape make a difference in terms of, of uh, forest carbon. When we think about how we apply those practices, uh, 
they sort of go in, in two categories in terms of adaptation and mitigation. So we know that uh, on the adaptation side, there's all kinds of uh, stand diversity management to increase diversity. Uh, assisted migration in some places a very valid uh, approach. Thinking about the the future forest that you're that you're planting today, what's it going to look like in 20, 30, 50 years from now? There's a whole suite of thinning tools that can that can have uh, effects on the landscape. Uh, one of the more interesting adaptation uh, tools, once you understand, for example, the hydrological dynamics on your forest management landscape, how much streams are going to come up, how much uh, you know, how much uh, spring freshet, what's it gonna look like on your landscape? You can start thinking about culvert size, which is something that, you know, as a biologist, I'd never spent much time thinking about. But if you look at some of the work that's been done in BC to show the number of culverts that blow out every year, if you put in oversized culverts, you not only increase, uh, you know, water capacity, but you also increase um, connectivity between lower and upper parts of watersheds for things like salmonids and other critters to get up. So it's, it's kind of a win-win, uh, but it, it does mean changing your, your culvert size and changing those requirements. So where you might have gotten away with a, an 18 inch culvert, maybe you wanna double or triple the size of that in some places. And then again, thinking about road design and location. Uh, yes, roads are, you know, so you can ostensibly get to your, your managed landscape and, and get the product off, but they can also be used uh, in terms of um, thinking about natural fire breaks. You put a, you put a road in, that's a, a pretty convincing fire break. On the mitigation side, you see a number of, of uh, tools that can help with increasing the sequestration, uh, whether it's, you know, increasing a, an enhancement of seed selection for increased growth and vigor, uh, soil protection to maintain soil carbon slash distribution. That was what I, we talked about at the University of Maine or, or fertilization. But again, you've got a bit of a suite of these, these thinning tools and what they do that might help uh, mitigation. And they're often, th those are kind of like the bang for your buck kind of uh, practices that help with adaptation and mitigation, depending on how they're used and where they're used and what you're using them for. Uh, so, you know, there's a suite of, of practices out there. We are continuing to do research with our our certified organization and other partners to develop new practices to try and enhance uh, uh, the ability of these organizations to adapt to climate change that comes along, as well as to increase mitigative potential. Um, you know, I, again, we talked about um, uh, sustainably managed forests able to help fight climate change. And we know there's a number of avenues that this, this works through. Um, you know, there's broad scale requirements for climate adaptation, mitigation, and fire event reduction. These are the new certification requirements I've just got done talking about. But we also have that reduction in carbon intense product use that that, that previous paper talked about. Uh, and then, you know, we can do this work of climate smart forest management and document the benefits going forward. So I think that's that's one direction that SFI is likely to go. And now that we've got our certified organizations applying these uh, new standards, uh, we're trying to document the climate benefits from that, that change over. So we're, we're really looking forward to seeing the results of that. Uh, and again, we're you know, continuing down the pathway of increasing research to find new methods and practices to enhance that. This paper, Ontel et al. 2020, this was some work, uh, again, that project with the American Forest Foundation, uh, sorry, yeah, American Forest, um, this came up with a sort of a practitioner's menu of adaptation strategies and approaches for carbon management. So you can, you can look at this practice, you can look at this uh, paper, get, get yourself a copy of it. There's all kinds of practices they put in there and the documented, you know, scientifically documented uh, positive effects of those practices and how they affect uh, uh, forest carbon uh, over the long term. So uh, again, this is all about uh, doing better going forward. You know, forest management is always about continual improvement. Uh, the last thing I need to say here uh, is that the standards, again, they were released in January 2020, so they're very fresh. The, the ink is still uh, fresh on them. Um, so all new certificates issued in uh, going forward in, in, after January 2022 will be issued to the new standards. As of April, all recertifications must be issued to the new standards, and all surveillance audits uh, will be to either or, depending on where the company sits on their, on their cycle. And finally, in January of next year, all certificates will have transitions to the new ones, and they will all be using the uh, the new uh, the new standards. So that's the timing of of when this uh, thing will be going out. When 
everyone will be using it. So uh, we're looking forward to, uh, again, we do an annual survey with our members looking at uh, you know, the data that they, they, they have to report to us every year. And this year specifically, we're asking, what did you do prior to the new standards and what have you been doing after the new standards have been applied to see if we can get that shift in baseline to figure out uh, what kind of a difference we're making in terms of climate adaptation and mitigation. With that, I, I do need to end. Uh, I would be in a lot of trouble if I didn't mention this. For those of you who are interested in forest sustainability issues uh, at a broad scale, our annual conference is happening June 14th to 17th in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, brace yourself, this will be a live conference. People will actually be there in person. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to that. And for those of you who uh, maybe have trouble getting out of the country or, or you know, you, you, maybe it's a little too soon for you, uh, next year, our conference will be in Vancouver. Uh, and I can assure you, I used to tell people all the time that this is one of the best conferences I've, I've ever been to, uh, but then I started working for SFI, so it sounds a little bit uh, uh, more disingenuous now. Um, but, but I can say it's, it's a really good conference and a, a very uh, interesting one for sure for uh, all those who attend. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll say thank you, and I guess we'll have some uh, questions. Brooke, are you uh, going to be hosting the question session? Yes, that's correct. So thank you, Darren. That was an excellent presentation. I, uh, I enjoyed the part about when you talked about synergy between adaptation and mitigation and getting the best bang for buck, as you said it, that was very, that was very insightful. So yeah, now we have about 20, 20 minutes for the Q&A. So I'll get right into it. So everyone feel free to post your question in the chat or in the Q&A uh, box and I'll address them with all our, share them to Darren. So we already got one question to start uh, and it's from Cynthia. It says, what is the difference between healthy and resilient forests from your perspective? That's, that's a, a really good question. Um, buckle up, I could probably talk about that for several hours. Um, uh, as an ecologist, the term healthy forest uh, well, let's just say it troubles me because I've, I often tell people that um, a healthy forest is any forest that's not a parking lot, essentially. Um, but, you know, in, in, it's one of those boundary terms that, that everyone uses because everyone sort of understands healthy forests. We say healthy forests. You can sort of look outside and see a forest and go, I think that's healthy or I think it's not healthy. Uh, from an ecological perspective, so long as, you know, ecological functions are still operating, we would still call it a healthy forest. Uh, but I think in this case, we're sort of talking about vigorous, growing well, um, you know, continuing to do what we want forests to do, be that, you know, uh, harbor biodiversity, capture carbon, make, make materials that we can, we can move to the marketplace or use for whatever means. Um, as far as resilience goes, that's a little bit easier to define, actually, in terms of uh, a forest that can, uh, you might say, take a hit and keep on coming, whether it's uh, fire or wind throw. Uh, or infestation, once it's uh, been damaged or, or set back, even, even by uh, harvesting, if it's, been, if it's been harvest, it comes back uh, quickly in the expected time frame within what you'd think of as the natural range of variation. Uh, so uh, to me, resilience is, is a more straightforward scientific term, uh, whereas healthy is a little bit more of a, a term of art, if you will, uh, but, but that's, that's how we generally think about those terms. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question, what research do you think is still lacking for better carbon management in forests? Well, that's, again, thank you for that question, because that's, that's playing right into the question that that's the, that's the drum that I keep beating. Uh, and when it comes to carbon, I think we really need to do a better job of understanding carbon dynamics in soils. Um, we know that a certain amount of carbon moves from the top layer down into deeper layers of the soil. I want to know if there are practices we can put in place to uh, enhance that. Uh, and then on top of that, we need to think about carbon mobilization uh, in terms of, you know, we know a certain amount of carbon actually gets removed from the upper layers down to the lower layers and then ends up in, you know, uh, in, um, uh, in underground water pathways. And then, you know, carbon actually comes out through our streams. And we need to figure out how that happens. And if there's ways we can think about slowing that process down so that more carbon ends up stored in the deep layers of soil where we know it stays a lot longer. Uh, so that, that's, that's just me. I would, uh, I'm not a soils guy. I need to point that out. So I'm not uh, self-serving uh, on this, 
but I, I really do think that, that soils are the, the new frontier of, of carbon in forests. Okay, sounds good. Um, we have another comment and then a question. So Graham says, great presentation and thanks for the updates on SFI's program. And the question is, how do we counter some of the recent misinformation that is being presented that counters the real benefits of sustainable forest management to benefit the climate and other ecological values? Um, I would say thank you, uh, Grant, for the comment. Uh, I think every uh, comms person working with the sector, with the government, uh, with anyone who you know thinks about these things is scratching their head trying to figure out the same thing. Uh, there are a number of, um, call it dishonest brokers of, of information out there that are saying what, what they want to say and they're often not challenged on it. Um, we know that well-managed forests are a tool to be used. Um, and there's a lot of folks that just don't want to agree with that. Um, and I don't have the immediate answer on how we counter that, um, but it's certainly a, a, a big job to be done. Sorry, I've, I don't have a good answer for that, I don't think. Okay, and we have another one for the panel. So how do we work across sectors to better explore the co-benefits of some of these adaptation actions? that are infrastructure focused, like upsizing the culverts. That was something that's interesting to think about. So uh, question, yeah. yeah, that's, how do we do that? I, I think it, it comes from the, uh, I think we can get there a lot through some of our forest adaptation work in terms of understanding what the risks are. If you have an area, you know, that's a really good example. If you have an area that you know flooding is gonna be more severe in the spring, uh, if you know that, you know, um, high flow rates are going to happen, I think that's the conversation you have with the, with the infrastructure folks, the roads folks, uh, to, to build that forward. I know there's a lot of work done in, uh, in the infrastructure world, thinking about how climate is going to affect what they build and, and where they build it. Um, I think, as usual, we find that, that policy and regulations take a little bit of time to catch up. That's interesting. Um... So another question we have is, what are the biggest challenges SFI certified organizations will need to overcome to meet the climate smart forestry objective? Uh, that's an interesting question because if you look at the SFI network, we have folks, uh, you know, we've got companies that are say large multinational companies uh, that have a, a, a deep bench of, of scientific expertise on staff. And then we have small operators who have, you know, relatively small amounts of private land that, that have to outsource all that. Uh, and we get sort of uh, fear signals across the board. And some of them just don't know how they're going to do this. So one of the things that we built into the new standard uh, is particularly around fire, uh, fire resilience and awareness and climate smart forestry. We built in an element to allow certified organizations to work collaboratively with their SICs uh, to work together on, on doing that. So. Um, that allows the small players to interact with the bigger players uh, and, and meet this because we know that whether you're uh, a, big, a big operator on the landscape or a small one, you want everyone to be operating sustainably because that one company that is not operating sustainably makes the entire sector look bad. So uh, across the sector, we're, we're finding uh, and fostering collaboration. But the biggest fear I think that we're seeing is especially for the small operators, they just don't have the resources to, to figure this out. They don't know how to identify what best science is, you know, what's the best available science when I mean, they don't have the expertise on staff to do it. Uh, so allowing uh, collaborative work and, and more to the point, encouraging collaboration across organizations is how we're trying to deal with those concerns. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another question, how do you think wildfires slash prescribed burning are affecting soil carbon? Yeah, okay. so. Uh, we obviously know that the more intense the fire, the more likely it's to affect soil carbon, burn down the, you know, the top layers of those, of, you know, the, uh, the, the top layer of soil that eventually would have contributed to the, to the deeper layers. Um, so we know intense fires are causing that problem. I think prescribed fires, although we do lose some of that uh, understory that might be contributing to the upper layer, at least the prescribed fires are not so intense. And, and avoid um, depleting that upper layer of carbon, which is, I think, what we need to avoid. So we need to have those prescribed fires in place to reduce the, the fuel loads, uh, in some cases to stimulate growth of, of other plants that need that disturbance, 
Uh, but to prevent the longer term bigger fires, I think that can really affect the, the soil carbon uh, and, and cause problems, uh, longer term problems. But again, I need to emphasize that I'm not a soils guy. So uh, I, I'd love to talk to someone who is a soils guy about this stuff. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Does the does SFI's Climate Smart Forestry Objective require organizations to do a full carbon accounting of their lands or operations? Uh, no, and that was actually, uh, you know, again, thinking across the spectrum of organizations, I think some of the larger organizations with massive land holdings would have been like, sure, not a problem, we can do that. But some of the smaller organizations uh, were a lot more reticent about being able to, you know, muster up the, the funding and the, and the, the work to, to do a full carbon accounting. Um, the other thing is we were really worried that, uh, and we, we, this was actually raised to us by a couple of organizations who were interested in carbon markets. If you know uh, developing a full carbon assessment and then making sure that the, the carbon storage was going up over time uh, was a standard piece of practice, they were worried they'd be locked out of carbon markets because carbon markets require you to do something for additional carbon. Um, so between those, those two problems, we do not require certified organizations to do a full carbon accounting. Obviously, if they want to, they can, uh, and then they've got a better story to tell. Okay. Um, another question, how might SFI's Climate Smart Forestry Objective interact with companies that may wish to enter the carbon market? So yeah, uh, that. yeah that was, uh, that's what I was just talking about. Um, uh, we actually had to have some conversation with some of the folks who do carbon accounting work for those carbon markets uh, to show that no, so long as we are not requiring certified organizations to, for example, increase you know, carbon on their landscapes in, addition, in an additional way, so long as that's not a requirement, it's not a problem for the, uh, for the carbon market folks. But that, that was a concern that was raised to us uh, during the development of the standard. Okay, and uh, my colleague Claire also mentioned in the chat, but if everybody would like to ask a verbal question, that's also, uh, good, so feel free to raise your hand and and ask a question at any time. But yeah, if not, we'll move to the next question. So does adhering to the SFI's Climate Smart Forestry Objective necessarily mean increased carbon sequestration on those lands that are certified? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question, a really um, sort of a key question. Uh, and no, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean carbon will increase. Although the research we've done shows that currently, even before climate smart forestry, uh, biogenic carbon on the landscape was increasing as is long-term storage of carbon in products. So it's a good story no matter what. Um, but we recognize that some companies you could, for example, you could buy a piece of land and decide that you want to uh, grow pulpwood. So if you're in the Southeast US, for example, pulp wood would mean a shorter rotation period to get the, the kind of wood you want. And that could mean on the ground, a lowering of, of carbon. But the Climate Smart Forestry Objective does require you to think about making sure no matter what climate change brings that that forest stays resilient, that forest stays uh, strong and growing. So that's a, that's a positive. So we keep the forest as forest essentially. And it requires you to look at your operations and say, what can I do to either increase carbon sequestration or reduce, um, uh, reduce my operational emissions in the event that you're planning on, on not increasing sequestration because you are changing your market base and that's the market signal you're responding to, then you might say, okay, well, I got to focus a lot of effort on reducing emissions. Uh, so overall, there's still that you know, long-term resilience of the forest on the land base Maybe there can be a, a, a lowering of carbon to some degree. It's obviously not going to go down to zero, uh, but you can uh, you can adapt and manage in such a way that you still get carbon benefits. It's just not necessarily an increase of carbon on the ground all the time. Although I'd say in most cases we're going to continue to see that that growth of biogenic carbon anyway. Okay, thanks for that. Um, that was all the questions we had sent in advance, and I'm not seeing any in the chat. So if anybody would like to ask some final questions or comments before we wrap things up, feel free to post them in the chat or raise your hand and ask verbally as well.
And yeah, if not, we'd just like to thank everyone for joining us here today for this FA Crop webinar. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And this presentation was recorded and we'll send it out to everyone registered and posted in the FA Crop as well for, for future viewing. For viewing. Um, I would like to extend a very big thank you to Darren for your time and effort and for a great and informative presentation. And is there any last comments before we sign off? Uh, not for me, but but, but uh, thanks again for the opportunity. It was uh, great to to talk about this work, and I would invite anyone who has uh, further questions to reach out to me. I think my email was on that last slide for a while, and uh, reach out to me uh, anytime. Happy to talk. We'll include your information in the follow up email too if oh, people great. would like to reach out. So excellent. So yeah, I think that's it. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.